your life. So just welcome everybody to um, this month's webinar for NHSR community. Uh, we're going to have a talk today on the data quality reporting for temporal data sets using the Daiquiri package. I'm just going to set up everything again because I've just taken over the uh, slide deck. I will just try and share that again. Bear with us with any technical issues that we've got. Um, I'm going to need some help because I, I probably shouldn't have done that. Let me just do this one. I'm back, it's all up there. That's the slides we're sharing, aren't we? So uh, just to introduce Fong, sorry, I didn't even say who the speaker right. was. This is brilliant for recording. <laughs> so Fong, would you like to uh, take over? Oh, is this? Yeah, the, yeah. this this will be great for YouTube, won't it? So data quality reporting, temporal data set, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks Zoe. Um, yes, so my name is Fong Quan and yep, I'm going to talk today about um, data quality in temporal data sets such as in electronic health records, why it's important to check for temporal, temporal artifacts and how you can do this easily uh, using the Daiquiri R package. So I'll start with a short introduction about me. Um, so I'm a statistician and data manager in the Modernising Medical Microbiology Group in uh, the Nuffield Department of Medicine in Oxford University. Um, I've taken a slightly um, non-standard um, career tra trajectory to, to get here. So after my undergraduate uh, degree in, in maths, I went and worked as a software developer in the private sector for a number of years before deciding that that wasn't what I, what I wanted to do with my life. Um, quit, spent a few years in the wilderness before deciding to retrain as a statistician. And that's when I moved to Oxford and, and joined the uh, MMM group in 2012. And so what I've been doing there, so mostly um, it's been work with electronic health records. We work very closely with the Oxford University hospitals. And uh, examples of uh, studies I, I've worked on have been sort of looking at um, uh, trends over time for particular infections, such as pneumonia, um, but also a range of other other things as well. Um, and something else I do is I develop and manage the infections in Oxfordshire Research Database, and this is basically a uh, sort of a linked database of um, hospital later records um, in, from the Oxf Oxford University Hospitals. Trust. Um, so it's a, a group of four hospitals around Oxfordshire, um, which includes things like patient records for sort of admissions and um, appointments, uh, as well as data from the laboratories, the microbiology laboratory, uh, hematology and biochemistry, and as well as sort of uh, things like sort of antib antibiotic prescribing. Um, these are, are linked together um, and then anonymized for uh, for use for research. And uh, I took a, a while about it, but uh, last year I finally uh, completed a PhD, um, which was focusing on data quality in EHRs and which largely forms the basis of what I'm going to talk about today. So a bit of background first. Um, so my field is, is in research, but everything that I'm going to talk about today equally applies to any sort of data analysis um, of, uh, of um, large record sets. And so what happens or what's supposed to happen is we're, we're interested in data quality. We know there's sort of the uh, the saying rubbish in, rubbish out. And so when we're supposed to look at it is during the initial data analysis uh, stage of the of the, um, the study. Um, so before you actually go ahead and run your uh, analysis or do whatever investigation you're doing, you should be checking that your data is actually suitable for the analysis that you're intending to run. In terms of data quality, typical things that people might do would be to check for missing values, um, look for duplicate records, maybe run some summary statistics, for example, um, uh, the min minimum or maximum mean values of a numeric field. Um, if you're going to create a, a regression model or something, you might look for outliers as well. Um, but these are typically done sort of across the data set as a whole. The problems with the current practice is that it is basically all ad hoc and undocumented. Um, you don't, you have to just assume that people have done it because uh, in the research field, 
when, when you have a published paper, there's no space in the paper for, for any of this. So you're just sort of um, taking it on faith that uh, people have checked their data beforehand. Another issue is that it often um, people often ignore the fact that underlying systems can change over time, especially if you're looking at data over a long period of time. Things will have happened in the real world, which means that the data that was collected um, five years ago may not actually look um, quite the same as, as what you're collecting now. This is especially true for, for routine data where you're not in, in control of how the data is being collected. And another issue is just the volume. We get so much of it, all the different uh, data fields, so many records, checking it all takes a lot of time and you may uh, sort of further down the line get a, a refresh of your data and then do you need to do all of this all over again to make sure that nothing new has uh, has crept in. So I'm going to give a, a couple of real world examples from the data that we have in uh, we've had in in the OUH. Um, so this graph shows you the number of admissions per month is that inpatient admissions um, over a 20 year period, and you can see sort of very obviously in sort of a 2008, there's this sudden jump upwards in, in the number of emissions and then in just before 2012, it suddenly drops down again and it's clear just by looking at this um, quick glance that you know that this is not um, something that's going on with the, the actual population um, of Oxfordshire. It, it's not that suddenly lots more people came in and then suddenly a lot fewer uh, people ca came in on a different date. When we went and, and looked into this, um, basically what was happening was that during this period, um, dialysis patients were being recorded as inpatients, whereas outside of the period they weren't being recorded as inpatients, and that was within the the, the hospital um, computer systems. And so, if you're using this data, for example, as a denominator, um, you you do need to sort of be quite careful that you don't sort of inadvertently get some erroneous results because of um, strange things that have happened that, you, that you've not uh, um, noticed. Another example is this is a graph of um, laboratory values for a test called creatinine, which is a biomarker for infection. Um, and this each point is the, the minimum value coming from the uh, um, test results per day. And you see there's three sort of different epochs going on in the first uh, period there's, there's this sort of bimodal distribution and uh, what's actually happening here is that the, the results were being recorded in, in two different units and then in the middle period where it's fairly stable um, everything looks looks fairly good and then um, suddenly in 2009 there's this shift downwards um, in the values and Obviously, when, when we went back to, to find out what happened here, it was that uh, there was a new assay, there was a new machine that was brought in to do this test. And at the time in the hospital, the clinicians would have been told that this new test was coming in. The reference ranges would be, would be different to what they were before. And so everyone knows to, to treat them differently. But if you're receiving this data set years after the fact, um, then you're not, it's, it's unlikely that you, that you will be told uh, about these sorts of things. And so you need to sort of, take it upon yourself to, to check for them. And so what I've shown you is just a couple of sort of um, anecdotal examples, but you know, how often do these sorts of things occur? Is it enough for us to really need to worry about? And how, how would we sort of know um, what the sort of um, um, frequency that, that 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 you need to well that, that these sorts of things happen and so I looked into this by doing some crowdsourcing um, so if you've not heard of it there's a, a, a um, citizen science uh, web-based platform called the Zooniverse um, it's free to use um, it's got millions of registered subscribers you can sign up and take part in whatever um, sort of scientific projects that are on there at the moment it's mostly um, sort of astronomy um, type uh, projects or um, sort of uh, ecological camera trap um, things where you sort of count the number of pen penguins that are in the picture. Um, but um, it, they have a, a project builder interface which makes it very easy to create your own project. And so I did this, I, I created a project called 
health record hiccups. And what this uh, involved was actually, so, so it was taking real world data from our IOL database in Oxfordshire. Took uh, eight different uh, data extracts covering di different sort of types of um, types of hospital data. Lots of data fields, lots of records and generated um, around 8,000 different time series graphs covering different um, sort of aspects that you might be interested in from a data quality perspective, such as the number of records, the number of missing values, um, etc. So what did the volunteers get asked to do? So when they uh, sort of sign up to, to take part in your project, um, to go through a, a tutorial and then um, they get shown an image. And so this is one of the time series graphs and when they, they look at the image, they get you're asked to draw a, a green line wherever they thought they saw a suspicious sort of change in, in the in the distribution of, of uh, data points. And so um, you can draw they could draw as many green line as many lines as they wanted. Green if they thought it was a very clear suspicious change that wasn't likely to be anything to do with the actual population, um, but more likely to be something that was sort of an artifact. Um, or they could draw a yellow line if uh, they, they weren't sure, but they wanted to mark it anyway. And so once 41 different people had uh, um, classified an image, it would then be retired and I could use those results to create some consensus um, markers, or consensus labels for, for change points. So this ran in September 2020. Um, over 2000 volunteers took part. I didn't have to do any uh, marketing or anything. Um, it was all sort of people who were already um, interested in the in this universe. And all 8000 images were completed in less than eight weeks, which was just phenomenal. Um, yeah, people just sort of smashed through it, really. Um, what sort of results did I get from it? So here's an example of one of the graphs. So this is the total number of inpatient records per day. And you can take a look at this and sort of imagine where you would have drawn lines. Where, where do you think there's sort of suspicious um, behavior in, in the data? Um, and then this is what the volunteers found. So the, the blue bars are where um, lots of different volunteers drew lines in the same place. Um, so I used a, a method called density based um, clustering with noise. So the, the numbers along the top, you've got uh, 27, 31 and 37. That's the number of people who drew a line basically within those blue bands. And then the red lines are the noise. That's where other volunteers drew lines here and there where they were just maybe a bit overzealous with their uh, drawing. Um, but the, these are considered noise and uh, were ignored. And so therefore, for this particular time series, um, the eventual result was that there are three different change points on it. So how many change points did we find across all the data sets? An absolutely huge number, um, four and a half thousand different, different change points were found. Um, basically in virtually every data field and virtually every calendar year, there was something suspicious looking in the data. Um, and so you know what this means that is that um, sort of any data extract that's obtained from EHRs is very likely to contain um, some temporal change points. And and while the um, the data we used was just from one trust, um, there's you know no reason to believe that we would be any different to any other trust. This is routine data; things happen all the time. Um, yeah, new equipment comes in, and um, yeah, you don't find out about it unless uh, unless you look. And so um, basically, emails that say everybody who, who uses this data for reporting, for um, other analyses, for, for modelling, need to sort of take this to, into account um, and uh, do something about it. And so it's sort of all very all all, uh, all very well sort of telling people to, to do this, but how can we actually help people? Um, to do it easily, um, and that's where the Daiquiri package comes in. Um, it's called Data Quality Reporting for Temporal Datasets. It's a slight play on words, it's an automatic uh, 
um, maybe not on aspic, illustrative um, play on Daiquiri. Um, but uh, so you can install it from CRAN. Um, what it does is you give it a data frame with any number and any type of columns. You just need one date column because we're, we're interested in, in temporal data sets. Um, and then it will output you an HTML report. So what do I mean by a temporal data set? Um, here's an example of uh, some, some prescribing data. This is a synthetic example. And so we've got uh, as sort of each hour is often like, there's a lot of text fields, um, a lot of categorical fields, we've got some numeric fields, the dose here for the prescription ID. It's just a, a row identifier. Um, and I've got some dates and I can, yeah, so so basically um, Daiquiri is designed to work on record level data. You've got one row per event, which is re uh, related to something that happened in a, at a point in time. And then all the other data fields are sort of information relating to that event. And you can see examples here, here's sort of thing you might get in from a, a raw um, data extract. You've got some sort of, you've got null values and you've got some, um, Default values for, for dates, which might, which just by looking at them, you can tell that they're not sort of real, um, real dates. Um, but so this is uh, the sort of thing that that you might be interested in looking at. Actually, it's, it's quite hard to tell from looking at the, the data set itself where there's going to be problems um, in terms of how it changes over time. But uh, um, what you do is you can create a report. So I'm going to do a demo of this, and I've just. Got find it here. So we've already installed the package um, and to attach it. So I've provided an example data set with a package and what we're going to do is to, to load it in but to load it in because it's a CSV file everything's text to start with and because one of the things that Dacker can do is to check for non-conformant values we're going to load them all in as um, character um, or, or load it all in as text and not do any sort of um, implicit uh, data type conversion. And there's a, a helper function supplied with Daiquiri so you can do that easily. And so if I now show you um, the head of the JHEAD file, that's basically what, uh, what was in the, um, the last slide. And so, so there's my data set. It's just in a data frame, and what I need to do is to specify what type of data is in each field. So prescription ID, I'm going to say it's a unique identifier kind of field. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be unique um, in the data set. It's just it's that type of um, data. And depending on the, the type of data that you're specifying, you will get different graphs at the end. So you've got to say which is your time point. So that's what's going to end up being your X axis. Um, here I'm choosing the prescription dates, but depending on what you're um, investigating, uh, you could equally set it to the admission date or whatever date is appropriate. Um, what you're doing. So here I'm saying my my admission date is a is a date date time type of field. Um, whoops. There's a few extra parameters because I say this one doesn't have a a time portion. So exclude that, uh, but I can also specify a um, column specific um, string for, for missing values. And so, and then there's other field types as well. So categorical is a common one, you might have a numeric um, data field for the dose. And then you can also ignore particular fields if you don't want to uh, create any graphs for them. So just going to run that. And now I can generate the report. Um, so, creating a, a Daiquiri report, provide it the, the data frame, the field types, and a few a few more uh, parameters that you can set. So you can set a sort of a data set wide set of um, strings for for missing values. You can give it some descriptions and a title. Important thing is to say what um, level of aggregation you want to do. So because it's record level data. Um, in order to create these um, time series, we want to sort of 
um, aggregate the data sort of on, on a daily basis or you can choose a weekly basis or a monthly or quarterly um, and then um, that means you can convert your text data into numeric time series data. And I'm just going to save it in the uh, current directory. So if I run this, so it's going through and it's just done all the aggregations, created the time series, and now it's generating the markdown report. And this is the, the bit that takes the longest generally because um, it's creating different uh, different tabs and fields and, and all the um, different plots. Here it's just, it's finished. So I've created just created this new report. I'm going to have a look at it in my browser. And so first of all, you get um, a little summary of the data that you've imported. So there's one row per data field. And just gets a bit of information like the total number of values in each in that field, number of missing values. And you can see here that in the admission date, we've got 45% of the uh, records are missing an admission date. Um, a few other sort of um, su summary uh, values that help you sort of spot immediate things like you might have a, a big outlier there. Um, and then the other interesting thing is the validation warnings. So this was why we, we passed in all this character um, because here is, this is basically um, the validations that that read R does for you. So I've just collated them. So when if you were to read in your CSV file using read underscore CSV, um, then by default it would generate quick, um, it would find these um, um, things that uh, it's not expecting and sort of save them into a, a warnings object um, and then strip them out of your data. And unless you're sort of paying attention and making a note to actually take a copy of those warnings, you, you've then lost them. Whereas here it's it's uh, keeping a record of them for you. And so sort of things that it, it, it's found is that, you know, that somehow there's you've managed to get a 31st of June date, which isn't a real date. Um, also in our sort of uh, dose field, which should be numeric, is actually there's there's a handful of uh, text in there, so it's had to take those out, but it's it's kept you a a record of what it's taken out. So if we go to the aggregations, so this is a sort of some, there's some summary um, summary plots to give you an overview of the data set. Um, top little uh, plot here is the number of records per day because we've asked it to, to aggregate the data per day and you can see sort of immediately that between April and May there were no records at all if something's gone wrong with the, the data it's, it's all missing there um, and also in July there's a sudden increase of records um, but you can also look per field that is not the same across all the different data fields the emission date behaves slightly differently to all the other to all the other data fields so that's for um, the, the number of values uh, in your data set over time. It's also, you can also sort of uh, look for uh, missing values. Again, we can see it's just the admission date that's missing. But if you were, if you go back to the, the source and where we saw that, you know, this this 45%, nearly half of the admission dates are missing. Um, it's not immediately obvious that actually they're all missing from the second half of the period. They're not evenly spread across. So, um, so yeah, depending on what you're doing, that may be important for you. So there's a few more tabs, so non-conformant values, uh, duplicate records, and then in the individual data fields tab, um, we can look in more detail. So there's one tab per data field, it's automatically generated, plus a couple of um, calculated fields. And so here's, uh, uh, you can look in more detail as to what's going on. So Every data field will have a um, number of values, a plot for the number of values, a plot for the number of missing values and percentage of missing values. And then depending on the type of data field that you said it is, you'll get a different set of additional tabs. So here, we, because this was a unique identifier field, we've got um, sort of the minimum string length of, of that identifier. Um, if we look at the date here, this is the um, 
prescription date. And so because this had a, a time part to it, something that we might be interested in is actually of our if you're if you're um doing something and you're interested in the actual time of day, then you um you you want to know whether your time of day is populated um sort of evenly across your data sets. And here you can see actually in the first half of the data sets, um there were um hardly any records that uh, that were set to midnight. So depending if you know your data well, you know that very little happens actually exactly at midnight. So the chances are that's not uh, a genuine time for you um, that can be uh, used. That's actually that implies that the, the time portion is missing. Um, and you see that that behaves differently in the, in the first half of data set to the second. Um, other examples are for the dose. So this was a numeric field. And so again, it's a, you've got extra um, have something how many non-conformant values there were. You can see these are there's not very many and they're fairly spread uh, fairly evenly. You're not need to worry about that. Um, then you've got the minimum and maximum values. Here you can see our funny outlier here. Um, and then uh, yeah, and for categorical data fields, um, you uh, get a sort of a, a tab for the distinct number of values. So you can, you can see that here in the location field, um, we used to have three different locations, and then in July we uh, acquired a, a new location. So that's the sort of basics of a, a basic report. But what if? Um, just go back. So I just remember where, where I'm going. This one. What if your um, if you know in advance in our location field? Go back to the. So where is it here? So I know I've got these different sites, and so and if I know that um, I'm getting I'm getting diff the data coming um, separately from these different sites, and I want to I'm be interested in looking at them separately rather than all together. So what you can do is create a stratified report. So the only difference here is we've got a uh, field type of strata, which means that we're going, I'm going to stratify my results, um, my my graphs by by the location, so the different sites. So if I update my field type specification and generate the report again, I'll generate a new report. So this takes a little bit longer because it's doing um, as well as doing sort of the uh, the graphs for the overall data set is doing a separate set with separate sets of graphs for each location in there. And the progress uh, getting there. Um, do you think what else uh, to tell you while we're waiting? So the other other um, actually that this is reliant on is the readr um, data dot table is what I use to um, do the aggregations and that makes it um, Quick and uh, and efficient um, when you've got a, a large data set um, that helps. And then obviously ggplot for the plots um, and reactable for the table formats. Um, here we go. There we go. It's done. Got new reports. Let's open it. So it's very similar to start with. Just a bit of summary of the data. But when we go to the Aggregated data. Your first tab is now a, a strata tab, so it tells you it's now split the data into the, the different sites, so the, the, the different values in your location field, and you can see actually the number of records there are in each stratum, and you can see immediately that site four starts appearing in July, um, whereas the others have been going. Um, have been in the dataset right from the beginning. Well, you can see the site two is also has a sudden sort of increase in records towards the end of the period. Same. So for the values present um, tab, we've got the same uh, graph as before for the overall dataset, but then you get a separate tab for each site on its own. You see just the number of records or the number of values present in each of those sites. And again, site four is where everything uh, starts halfway through. 
the same for missing values and the other tabs. Um, and then the other difference is in the individual data fields. So here we've got the sort of uh, the, the numbers for, for the overall data set in the top, and then we've got individual plots for each of the stratum um, underneath. So you can get a quick visual view of what's going on, and you can see what's happening in, in my different sites um, and when. And you can very quickly just sort of skim through all of these um, to see where, where anything strange is, uh, strange is appearing. And then when you find something unusual, it's your responsibility to, to, to then go and figure out how, how to deal with it and, and uh, what you need to do to uh, make sure it doesn't uh, ruin your results. Um, so that the demo, um, so why, why use it? Um, well, uh, I kind of want to encourage good practice. It's, it's good to check your data. Uh, we we should all be doing it more. Um, and uh, yeah, if if you want to sort of feel confident in in, in the results you're you're producing, then you need to feel confident with with the, the data that you're putting into it at the start. Um, it increases transparency. So the HTML reports they are sort of standalone documents. You can email them to team members, you can keep a record of them somewhere. Um, if you're a researcher, you can sort of uh, submit them as sort of supplementary material for, for your paper. Um, and people receiving it don't need to have any expert knowledge. They don't need to have R running on their machine. They can just open the document. It's just an HTML document. Any, any browser will open it and they can have a look. Um, and so that you can sort of, you have a record of the fact that you have actually checked your data. I've hopefully, hopefully shown that it's easy to use. Um, and it's sort of, I think one of the sort of main benefits is that your data doesn't need to conform to any particular format to start with. Um, it is just sort of any sort of record level data with a, a date field. And lastly, um, the code has been peer reviewed and accepted at R OpenSci, which means that um, they they will guarantee to keep it uh, sort of available and maintained into the future, even if uh, sort of whatever happens to me, it will still be available. So it's not going to just sort of suddenly disappear. And so you can feel confident that that you can rely on it um, into the future. So a few links. So so yeah, there's a uh, documentation website which has a detailed walkthrough vignette um, as well as uh, um, links to a couple of example reports. Um, the code's all open source. Um, if you try it out and, and want to um, report a, a bug or a, ask for something, some additional feature, then uh, please raise an issue. Um, and lastly, sort of quick thanks to my, my supervisors and the people who've um, sort of contributed to the data in IORD as well as uh, Zooniverse and uh, iOpenSci people. And so I think that's the end. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, let's, I think I might stop sharing there. I'll send you. Picture. I think that's already gone on anyway. I just yeah. want to say thank you. That seems like an immense amount of work in that package. <laughs> and I know you've given um, thanks to people, but it's really only your name that appears on the code. I had a look on the GitHub. So, I mean, that just to recognise that you've done so much work there. The, um, one yeah. of the things we don't do as analysts is look at the structure, and not the structure mm -hmm. as much, but the, the just in a metadata way, mm -hmm. our data. We know it really well from the yep. intricacies in it, but this is brilliant. <laughs> I'm blown away by it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, so so yeah, obviously, yeah, I, I did spend quite a lot of time writing it. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, I just I just hope that people use it, basically, hmm. you know. Um, there's, yeah, there, there, there's been a definite effort to try and make it as easy to use as possible, because that's, that's sort of what's, what's going to sort of encourage, encourage the take up. Yeah. One of the things I did want to ask was, you've generalised this really well. So did you always have that intention from the very beginning of your package? Or did you work with data and think how to, it's just that thought process. Because as I say, as analysts, we tend to work so thoroughly in one set of data, but you've made mm -hmm. this available to any data, so long as it's got 
some temporal feature with it, some dates. Yep. What 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 hell what sort of led you to that thinking? So basically, so this has come from my own experience and starting off and working with EHRs of different types, different formats, and things that I've I found and actually sort of a lot of the driver is that what would I want? How how would I want something to work for me to be able to use it? And, and that was basically how it, how, it, how it came about. So sort of design choices were actually, you know, I'm going to be using if I'm going to be using this, how do I want it to work? And um, yeah, and basically sort of making it as painless as possible to and as sort of adaptable as possible was was a key a key driver for that. Yeah. A, I've got one more question, but if anybody has any questions, if you just put them into the question and answer, that should be open for this team's meeting. One of them is a technical question, actually, because mm -hmm. I notice you're using our markdown for the output files, yep. which is a brilliant feature of um, our working in R. But have you thought about or is that a consideration for moving to Quarto? Is it, are you just going to stick with our markdown? It's just how does the new functionality of mm -hmm. Quarto feature? So I... So, um, so I started writing this. So I started writing this before Quarto came out, or before it was publicised, anyway. Um, so the I, I think part of my um, thinking is to actually to try and keep it as backwards compatible as possible for as long as possible. So I'm not sure yet that there are any features in Quarto that are so good that I would want to move it over um, because R Markdown pretty much does everything that. I needed to do at the moment and, and until the point where actually no one's using our markdown anymore or um, where quarter does something that's you know that's sort of invaluable um, I think we'll stick we'll stick with our markdown basically yeah, that seems a very reasonable thing to do Lot, it yeah. is at that point of the discussion or the decision making do you yeah. go backwards and a lot of people are using and learning our markdown still mm. There has been a comment that's come through, which is another R Open Sci package that does some other features of data visualization called VizDat. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the extra features are talking about your particular package. And I just want to point out that there's 18 contributors to that other package. Yeah. So I just want to say you've done a load of work on your own, seemingly. You've had support, but the actual coding part. Yeah. I've been messing around it's, with a couple of packages with the NHSR community. It's not an easy thing to do, yeah. <laughs> technically, so, as well as fitting the other things in. Mm. Go on. Um, so, so I'm I'm vaguely aware of his stats, um, mm -hmm. and yes, it, it's it's got a um, it, its aim is is to visualise your data, but my understanding is it is not um, looking at temporal data. Basically, it's your your data set as it is. And so it doesn't sort of know when there's a gap in your time in the, in the when your records. So if, if where we saw there's a, a month that was missing, I don't think VizDat would identify that for you. Whereas here I'm filling in the gaps of the, the entire time frame that your data set covers. Um, and that's what it's, yeah, it's aim is, is specifically to look at temporal features. Yeah, so this is metadata about the data, whereas VizDat could be it says preliminary explore, exploratory visualization of the data mm. so it's there's two elements of the data isn't there and i think the the element that you've looked at is the one that we don't look at so frequently like yeah gaps basically and changes um yeah. and to be able to report that to other people like this bit you can well we've had it with covid mm. we are talking about it you know, this bit before yep. covid look you know we can do this but then there's a bit where we're not so sure that we can actually use that data mm -hmm. in comparison and then we start again but yep. it's different yeah and, and you just you need to keep checking it because yeah. there's more data coming in all the time yeah and you don't know what's going on <laughs> yeah because you're not in control of it yeah. and on the process because you've put this onto cran and it's gone through our open site mm -hmm. um they're two different kind of peer reviews how what did you experience with those what, what was it like because uh, you get different kind of reports particularly for cran so cran was very much um just very specific cran specific things so there wasn't a code review per se it was like there's automated checks it needs to pass all your uh your cran checks um and then so and then the the r open side side was um 
um, more sort of nuanced, thinking more about sort of usability, thinking more about um, naming conventions and sort of style and and things and um, yeah, so so it was once yeah, I mean, and our site expects you to pass all the crown checks as well. So it's not two separate things really. If if it gets through open sorry, it's going to go, it's going to get past crown. Um, except there's some some weird things in crown. <laughs> um, technical but, uh, technical yeah. um, things that you have to sort of satisfy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but it was a good experience with with our open site. Um, definitely, they, they they do they do care about uh, sort of um, yeah, making it a good experience as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I do try to promote uh, the fact that it all not all packages need to come from CRAN. In terms of technical, some mm. IT organisations only say CRAN, but our open side doesn't have everything on CRAN as well because they leave it to the owners to choose. And yeah. it's a great place to get your packages from. Yeah, and so yeah, uh, I mean, I find that Crown's still the default place that people would expect to to, to get things from. It's it's sort of yeah, least effort really. Um, so uh, yeah, I I would say that get it on Crown if you can. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's good for it to be elsewhere as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll say thank you for this uh, slot that we had. Is I'm going to go and play with the package and have a look at the it's code <laughs> underneath because I'm quite keen to know how it's all put together. And that's the lovely thing about being open source. So thank you as well yeah. for also putting it out so that's available to dive into. And um, just to say thank you to everybody who's come. We'll be publishing this on YouTube in due course and uh, people can catch up and go to their favourite bits when they would like to in their own time. So yeah, thank you very thank much again. Thanks for so coming Thank you along. for having me. It's been wonderful. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, bye.